It's probably going to ask you if you're okay with somebody recording this video, just go ahead and click yes. Um, that way we can go back and look at it later. I had some folks ask me if it was going to be recorded and I said, sure, absolutely. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, so starting off on the right foot and my theme for tonight, I really wanted it to be um, like it's like the title says, starting off on the right foot and reality versus expectations. Um, this is one of the two newest publications we have from UT Hort and the UT Hort team. And it's a, it's a group of agents across the state that come up with a lot of this stuff. You can find on the UT Hort site as well. And our specialists obviously do a lot of work with that too. And um, again, reality versus expectations of home fruit. And this is a big, massive flow chart. You can see, you know, basically walking you through the process of decision making, you know, is fruit really right for me? If so, what fruits are right for me and what can I do um, with my time, you know, effort, energy, things of that nature? And also what kind of sites do you have available? So those are some things to consider whenever we start out. And we'll kind of go over these and extrapolate these as we go on throughout um, this evening. Starting from scratch. So if you are brand new, don't have a clue about fruit production, um, this is where I would encourage you to start. And this is, again, it's just a little handout publication and we can have, uh, or we do have different publications. You know, there's strawberries, apples and pears, cane berries, and then blueberries. Uh, we also have one for strawberry. Well, excuse me, there's strawberries right there. We don't have one for peaches. I think that's one they're working on. That's what we get asked the most about is peach production in the, in the home garden or backyard. But, you know, we're talking about site selection, soil prep, and actually planting and your space requirements, which I'll talk about more and more as we go on throughout tonight. But this is a really funny picture to me. And because of this, this is what we might see in a supermarket. Okay, I don't know where this picture was taken, when it was taken, but a lot of people get really amped up about home gardening, home fruit production and expect what you see in a grocery store a lot of times. And unfortunately, sometimes that's just not reality. We're talking about differences in equipment, time, money, and financial resources, as well as, you know, just general know-how. Um, some people, if, if, you know, if you're a farmer and you've been doing it your entire life, then you're going to know obviously what to do. But as far as pest control, disease control, um, and then just general cultural practices, there's a big learning curve. And this is what I, my goal is for this series is to kind of shorten that learning curve for everybody that's involved and to help you in the long run, that way you make good decisions up front and we have some fruit on the back end, right? Not saying it'll happen tomorrow, but that way we can have the potential. Um, and again, this is what some people expect. This is a commercial orchard. I'm not sure where it's at, but um, you know, agriculture as a whole is a really romantic type of um, endeavor, I will say, you know, living off the land, you know, with nature and things like that. So, but, I want you to take a second and look at this and I'll slide. I'm not sure if you, if that impacts you guys or how much you can see or not, but take a look at this picture really fast. Um, and, and if you notice the apple, this lady is holding is totally different from what's on the tree. And I think it's very ironic and very funny because, you know, that can be the perception of home gardening in general, but especially fruit production. You know, what she's got in her hand looks like a red delicious and what's on the tree is definitely not red delicious. It looks more like a gala, um, maybe a honey crisp, something like that. Wine sap, maybe I, I'm not sure, but that's just the reality. The perception and expectations have to be realistic. OK, so that's the big thing we want to start out with. Do you want edible landscaping? I was talking to uh, an individual this afternoon before I left the office to come home. They were talking about having blueberry bushes as more like a screen, which can be done. They're, they use, they're, they're used as a screen in a lot of circumstances, but they're not managed for fruit production. So if you just want something where, hey, you have good pollination, everything worked right, didn't get hit by the frost, you know, and you go and pick a few, that's fine. Um, but again, it has a different purpose, right? Uh, do you want to support wildlife? And this is kind of a funny picture because there's a lot of people who have blueberries or um, apples, pears, or especially, you know, 
I think of apples and pears of the white-tailed deer, if those branches are low enough to the ground and you don't have a deterrent, they will get on their hind legs and pick them off the branch if they are ripe. And so you have to kind of be aware of, you know, if you have blueberries, for example, you need to probably utilize some netting of some sort to deter uh, birds and other little critters. So it's fine if you want to support wildlife, but if we really truly want home fruit production, we really need to have some careful planning and selection of cultivars. Hey, Miss Debbie, Mr. Larry, can you guys see that whole entire slide? Like it's not cutting you off. You can see careful the word entirely. Okay, good deal. Because on my screen, I see boxes where people have joined in. And so I'm just making sure you guys can see everything. Um, tell you what, we'll just go ahead and do that. Gets it out of my way. Okay. So careful planning and selection of cultivars, right? Plant management, uh, pest and disease management, and attention to harvest. Now, these four we're going to talk about more in depth again here in just a little bit, but these are all very critical for home fruit production. If you're wanting to put bowls of blueberries on the table, if you're wanting to make strawberry jam from your own strawberry patch, right? And so you've got to be cognizant of that and understand how much work it really does take and, and what you need to do to get to that point. So again, what is possible? Let's look at the big picture. There's two, well, really, if you want to do the math, it's six, but the, the two points I have on this slide are your philosophy on management, okay? And the five S's, sun, slope, soil, space, and sweat. And we will go over those in depth here in just a minute. But your philosophy on management by far is the biggest one. If you're okay with not having fruit every so often, that's fine. If you want fruit every single year, your management is going to be a lot more stringent, a lot more strict, uh, comparable to a commercial operation uh, on a small scale, but we're, our livelihood is not relying on it, okay? But um, we're going to go into the five S's here. So let's talk about sun first. Sunlight is, I mean, it's the number one ingredient. It's the biggest key we got to have. And that's for growing landscape plants. That's for growing pastures and hay fields. That's for trees, vineyards, whatever it might be, uh, vegetables as well. So sun, we need at least eight to 10 hours of sunlight per day. And we want early morning sun and more than late afternoon. The reasoning for that is it gets the dew off of the leaves and off of the plant material faster, which leads to lower disease pressure later on down the road. And so we want that early morning sun you know, it doesn't have to be as soon as the sun comes up. It can be, you know, in the summertime, 8.30, 9 o'clock, but it needs to be in the, in the morning more so, <clears throat> excuse me, more so than the late afternoon. Also, in the late afternoon, you can get some sun scald on certain types of fruit. Strawberries are notorious for doing that sometimes. <clears throat> um, in my experience, now that was in Georgia where we also had a little bit more heat involved as well, but it's a balance. So you need to make sure that you have sunlight, but again, put more emphasis on the early morning sun. Slopes is our next slide here. Uh, we want a gentle slope, if at all possible. I know that's not ideal. Some places were just flat as a pancake. Some places, especially here in East Tennessee, it, nothing is flat. So I completely understand. Now, we just want a gentle slope is ideal. Uniforms, uh, uniform slope for air and water drainage. That's also, again, having to do with the air movement in the mornings and in the evenings, <clears throat> whenever that sun comes up and goes down. Uneven slopes, they can be harder to trellis. Now, is it possible? Sure. Just warning you, it is harder. Um, and you might have more variable soil conditions as you go, say, down the hill. Um, if you're going to trellis like that, try to go on the side of the hill. It might give you some better uh, as far as soil consistency, but your soil is going to change drastically from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. So keep that in mind. However, raised beds can be a great leveler in that scenario. Um, we're actually thinking about putting some here at the office. And uh, we have approximately six inches of topsoil in some spots and other places we have limestone bedrock showing. And so Raised beds are the way to go in our, in our scenario behind the office. And so, again, utilize that tool in the toolbox whenever you can. Um, not saying you can't do it on any uneven slope, but just know that 
there's a possibility there. Okay, let's go over soils real fast. Uh, mineral soils, for the most part, you want your pH to be between 6.0 and 6.5. That's pretty true for about everything under the sun and most fruit. However, blueberries is by far the anomaly in that category. Blueberry production, I would encourage folks to do it separately. You know, have your garden plot or your, your fruit area or your orchard, and then have blueberries on, on a different site. Um, not completely a different site, but in a different little spot there because of the pH difference. It has to be so different and so low compared to everything else that either blueberries are going to do very well or everything else is going to do very well. So you kind of have to pick your battles there um, and get a soil test. That's the number one thing you need to do. If you don't get a test, it's just a guess. That's what I like to tell folks, homeowners and farmers as well. Um, so make sure you just, you know, spend a little bit of money, get your soil tested and really get, get to the bottom of, of what your pH is, what your nutrient, you know, content looks like, things of that nature. Your minimum rooting depth, 30 to 36 inches. That's really for, I would say, trees. Strawberries are very shallow rooted. Your blueberries and your, your blackberries probably need that uh, much room. Um, so keep that in mind as well. In generally speaking, we're, we're talking low to moderate fertility. Good water supply, well drained in an ideal scenario. Now I understand a lot of us have red dirt clay in the backyard. We got to deal with it. It is what it is. But um, try not to have them. Try not to let them have wet feet. Nothing really like wet feet, including us. Um, you can use raised beds in that scenario. And most of these fruits shouldn't follow veggies because of disease pressure and things like that. And uh, you know, pest issues is a big one. So make sure you keep that in mind and, and try to rotate stuff if you can. All right, let's go over space here real fast. And this is simply just a slide to kind of let you see some of the dimensions based on a single plant in each one of these um, categories. So blueberries, you're looking at five to eight feet you know, or five by eight feet. One plant is roughly 40 square feet. So you got to consider that. And we're not even talking cubic feet. We're just talking surface area flat on the ground. You know, we're, <laughs> it's not really considered cubic as far as how high it might be, things of that nature. So make sure you keep that in mind as well when you're going planning or through the planning process of, of starting some fruit production. Cane berries or blackberries, raspberries, uh, anywhere from 16 to 32 square feet. Strawberries kind of shine in this realm because they're very, very small and they can produce a lot of fruit in a small amount of space. That's why they're so popular. One plant, you're looking at one to two square feet. That's it. That's why they're very popular in raised beds. Um, the matted row system that's actually in the ground and also in containers, which we'll talk more about a certain each individual crop as we go on throughout the, the summer here. Um, and your grapes, I know, I believe Andrew said he has grapes. I'm not sure if anybody else has grapes or not, but um, you got to have a pretty good trellis system. Make sure you understand that as well. But the, the square footage, 240 square feet, roughly. That's just, you know, for one plant, one vine. So keep that in mind. Now, the big thing when we talk about space, obviously grapes, you need some space, but with trees is the biggest, that's the biggest decision. So for apple trees are a great example. And these bottom two uh, points here, or bullet points, excuse me. Whenever I'm advising folks, and I would advise you the same way, talking about choosing apple varieties, not necessarily specific varieties, but the type of tree, dwarf, semi-dwarf, or a standard height. Um, dwarf apple trees are going to be anywhere from 120 to 320 square feet. That's pretty big. You, know, you look at the height there, 18, 18 to eight to 16 feet by 15 to 20 feet, you know, and you're, that, that's kind of a ballpark estimate depending on your fertility, the exact spot it's in, but your standard apples, look how much big of a difference that is. That's over double the maximum of a dwarf apple tree. So that's really where variety comes into play and where you've got to make a really good decision up front in order to really pick your fruit later on down the road. And so if you get a standard size apple tree by, you know, seven, eight years, you may or may not be picking a ton of fruit just because of the sheer size of the tree. It may be a great producer and that's fine, but a lot of the deer are going to be picking them up off the ground because it's just so large. So I always encourage folks to make sure you know what you're getting into as far as picking those type varieties and understand why we're making that stressful or putting stress on that decision up front. 
Okay, what else impacts space? Um, for me, it's it's pretty easy. More than one variety is needed in some circumstances. I had a, a call about a month ago about pecan trees, and we do not have this currently, but I, we, we need to probably work on it. Um, but there are certain types of pecans or certain varieties that flower at the same time, and you've got to have two varieties of pecans for good pollination or for successful pollination. Here we see muscadines are, are one as well. Blueberries are in that category and apples and pears. So make sure you get varieties that flower, you know, at similar times in order for good pollination. A lot of times we get a call when we have a single apple tree and they say, hey, you know, my apple, I've never gotten any apples and it's 10 years old. And I ask, okay, well, what varieties do you have? And they say, well, I've only got one tree. That would be why, because um, it, you, you up your odds a lot better whenever you have two varieties. So another thing to, to keep in mind. Okay, your sweat and time. This by far, in my opinion, is high on the totem pole. How much time and effort are you willing to put in? Um, you know, and how much time do you do you have really? You know, if you work a full time job and you travel for work, uh, and you're you're gone a lot of time in the summertime, like me, and you're on the road, home fruit may or may not be the best thing for you because you're you're outside of that window for harvest for for you know um, pest management things like that. Now, mechanization is really not much of a factor because again, we're doing small scale stuff. And then uh, fruit is often a long-term investment. That's the biggest thing I could stress to folks. Fruit is a, is a long-term investment. Don't expect fruit, you know, one, two years down the road. And expect, well, except for strawberries or blackberries, but your, your bigger stuff like blueberries, um, grapes, your tree fruits, peaches, pears, apples, you're in it for the long haul and it, it's an investment. Yeah, it seems like a lot of work up front, but it's worth it in, in, in the end. If you take one thing away from tonight, one thing at all, this is the slide I want you to write down. Match your fruit with your life. And do not match your life with your fruit because you will find that if you do it backwards, you're going to end up not liking home gardening or fruit production and just not not really liking it at all. That's just, um, that's the reality of the situation sometimes. So that's why we encourage folks, match the fruit with your life, not your life to your fruit. You don't wanna have your, your garden rule over your life. And this is a great example. Um, and I'm just gonna talk peach production really fast. So let's start down here in December and January. For example, we're gonna be doing dormant sprays probably for uh, San Jose scale, something like that. And then if we're planting new trees, we wanna do that in the winter time when everything is still dormant. Uh, February, early March, we're talking about pruning in, in that same time frame for established trees. Um, fertilization, you're gonna probably do it twice in April, once at the very beginning, maybe once later. And we're talking about thinning fruit if we have a really good fruit set in, in the pollination period. And pest control, pest control really should be an entire circle around this, um, around this wheel here, because, you know, all of this is technically involved in pest control. You know, thinning is a good, uh, good active uh, practice to, to control some pests because you don't have as much fruit there. Also, so you don't have to spray as much and you don't have as much to cover and you can really hone in on what to get. Um, pruning is another big one. Dormant sprays are a huge one, but then also like harvest and cleanup. Those are your two biggest forms of pest control um, under that umbrella term because you harvest on time, no diseases get it, and no insects get it. You clean up and have good cleanliness and sanitation in your orchard or your, uh, your garden spot, then you're not going to have a tissue to harbor disease to carry over to the next year. So that's kind of why we really encourage folks to you know, match your fruit with your life, not your life to your fruit. Okay, let's take a look at harvest periods here. And this is kind of where we talk about matching it to, to your lifestyle. <clears throat> you know, for me, um, I look at somebody, for example, if you, the kids get out of school and you want to take vacation in May and June, then strawberries might be a struggle for you. 
unless you know you have um, really, really good management practices or if you have a neighbor that wants some, you know, hey, tell them to come over and pick them. That's fine. Um, but let's look at blackberries, for example. If you like to go on that 4th of July beach trip, you know, with the family and you're going to be gone for two weeks, that's in the middle of blackberry harvest season. So that may, may or may not be the best one for you. Or you just need to understand that up front. You're either going to have some spoilage or some waste. Um, or you're, you know, you're going to have to ha call a buddy or a neighbor and say, hey, can you, you, you want to go pick the blackberries? That's fine. But that's really where we want to, again, match our fruit with our life. Talking about expectations here. This is uh, planting to full crop. We're going to focus really on the third column right here. Um, planting to full crop. This is the amount of time it takes from planting to get to that first full crop. Now, this is an estimate. This is not a guarantee. A lot of this stuff is very site specific and also your management practices and what you do to manage and your management philosophy. That's why we put that on the front of the presentation. So let's just look at apples here. This is another reason I encourage folks to do uh, full dwarf trees. Look at the comparison here. <clears throat> y'all can see my cursor full dwarf trees we're looking at four to five years to a full crop versus a semi-dwarf six to eight years so we're potentially getting a full crop in half the time if we just select a full dwarf tree now that can make the difference in the world if we're doing this for the first time and it will encourage you to continue to try more and more and more stuff um again Cane berries or, or let's talk about blackberries, for example. You're looking at two years to a full crop, your, your, your floor cane year, which we'll go into what floor canes are later on. And, you know, your strawberries. This is why strawberries are really popular. You got one year to six months, depending on what type of uh, production system. If you're doing matted row, you're going to plant those and let those berries or let the plants grow and run and establish themselves over the first year. Uh, but if you're doing plastic culture, uh, and you're planting in the fall, then you're looking at six months time. So it, it really depends on what you want to do and how you want to manage. And also the life expectancy is, you know, a, a considerable um, decision you need to have in mind as well. Okay, so this chart right here, we're going to walk over it from left to right and and this is just generally speaking, okay? Starters, low investment costs, uh, and you can do these in small spaces. You really need to be looking at strawberries, blueberries, and, and cane berries because they these are the easiest ones to grow. They're pretty low maintenance, and so uh, you don't have a lot of time or you don't have a lot of space. And or you don't want to invest a whole lot up front. This is that's where you need to be right there. That's where I would encourage you to start. Uh, let's talk about the middle of the road here, the second tile. You know, you can do some grapes, especially muscadines. Muscadines are fairly easy to do if you've got the space. Again, you got a trellis system and you got you got to figure that out as well. Uh, high bush blueberries can be really good. And then again, cane berries or, or blackberries. I think we're mostly talking about raspberries there. It's hard to grow raspberries in our our area though, in, here in Tennessee. Um, and then get to the middle tile. Challenging is your time consuming and it, I'm gonna tell you it's probably a higher skill level. So if you can do these with success and you've had some success in the two previous or tiles there, I would encourage you if, you, if you have some confidence, you can do this, you can definitely do it. Apples, pears, some table grapes or bunch grapes, we don't have a lot of people growing those in the backyard. Um, maybe Andrew, I'm not sure what, what types you've got, um, but peaches, peaches is by far one of the hardest ones just because everything loves a peach. <laughs> I don't know what it is about them. They're, I mean, I really like them, but you take how much you like a certain fruit, multiply it by about 20 or 25, that's how much disease and insects like fruit. So you have to keep that in mind when you go to make these decisions. Some things that are probably not worth or not likely to happen. Um, wine grapes, tart cherries, plums, um, figs. I know, I believe Andrew said he is growing some figs. So we'll see how that turns out. I saw some figs that were produced successfully in Georgia. So I'm not gonna tell you it's impossible, but um, they are very hard, they're very difficult. 
not likely to happen. You're looking at sweet cherries, almonds, bananas, uh, apricots, and olives. Uh, if you want to have banana trees and you want to take them in, I know people who take them inside every single winter. If you want to do that, that's fine. Go for it. But that's a lot of management. And to get bananas um, off of them is pretty difficult. But also, you know, to me, buying bananas at the grocery store, the supermarket, isn't too bad of an idea when they're, you know, what, $1.60, $1.70 a pound. It's not too bad. Okay. Let's take a break here um, from the actual, talking about actual varieties and stuff like that. We're, let's talk about pest control really specifically here. And this is one single pest I've got on the screen. And it's called a spotted wing drosophila, or SWD, as a lot of us folks call it in the ag world. And but spotted wing drosophila is in the common fruit fly family. And the male. I believe, yeah, it's the male. The, the female does not have spots in their, on her wings, but the male does. You'll be able to tell because he's got two little black spots on the very tips of them. Um, I actually saw one in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So they are around us. They are here. And you kind of have to be on the lookout for them. But our management practices and management uh, difficulties change whenever we saw SWD for the first time in Tennessee about uh, 10 years ago. So used to on the left hand side here, we're looking at without spotted wing, what it was like to grow uh, fruit in the backyard. Uh, and this is on a commercial scale as well. Blueberries were probably the easiest thing to grow along with muscadines. Um, blackberries were pretty easy to grow. Strawberries were, were fine. Um, and then down the line there. But when SWD showed up, you can see where blueberries went. Blueberries went from being way up here to all the way down here in the orange tile, all the way in the, in the orange category. So just by one pest showing up, that's what it did to blueberry production in the backyard. And so that's just one pest. That's one little fly that loves fruit. And so you have to really make sure we're on the lookout for pests. Um, a lot of people think, unfortunately, you can just, Put fruit out there, you know, give us some fertilizer or just plants in general, and then come back two months later and you have fruit magically. With this guy around now, you really have to be diligent. There are some types of traps you can build at home. And if you want that information, I can give it to you. But I felt for tonight, we're just going to acknowledge that. You know, again, that's how dynamic this one little guy has been for uh, fruit production in the Southeast. Okay. Let's look at disease resistance and cultivar selection. Um, my philosophy that I'm a big college basketball fan, so I've been watching some hoops lately, but the best offense is a good defense. Uh, you see a lot of teams in this time of year, if you play really good defense, you have a good chance to win the ball game. Same can be true when you select a really good variety up front. Again, I put a lot of I put a lot of weight and a lot of stress on that one decision, but it really can make the difference in your success and not uh, not succeeding. Climatic challenges is our biggest thing here in the southeast. Um, we've had some folks move to Jefferson County um, from California, you know, other places uh, that don't have as much humidity here or or back home where they're from. And I joke with them. I say, yeah, it's it's hot here but it's also just wet. I mean, there's some days whenever you walk outside, it's like you, it's not quite Louisiana bad where it feels like you just took a shower and walked outside without drying off and put your clothes on um, where you're just sopping wet. But some days it feels like that. And so with that brings more moisture and that brings on more disease. That's what we have to make sure we try to avoid on the front end and making a bad choice. But I want to quickly go over this, and this is public knowledge, and I will send this um, either in a, a link or an email, something to you guys, and it's called our fruit supplier list. And this is one of the handiest tools we have come up with. I say we, our fruit, uh, our home hort team has come up with it. So you'll see at the bottom here, we have strawberry, strawberry plugs, blueberries. We have all these types of fruits and where to order them from. And so this is a very handy piece of information, um, again, that I, I'll be happy to share with you. But, you know, let's say you want some early glow berries for strawberries. This is where you can get them from. Um, and people might say, and you might be asking yourself, why, why can't I just go get them from 
I'm not going to name big box stores, but let's just say a big box store in general. There's one, I'm sure, down the road from your house that sells strawberry plants. Well, the problem is, and there's, well, there's no really problem with it, but the issue could arise where you have it coming from the farm to a distributor, to the store, to you. So you got four people, four hands touching that plant. All that is is more chances for disease, more chances for the plants to actually die, um, and more chances for things to go wrong. But if you do it this way and order it directly from a supplier or from a farm, and a lot of people you know can get the, they may have a website you can go to and order them, or you just give them a call. Um, but what it does, it, it shortens that chance. It shortens that window and it decreases the, the likelihood that you get a disease plant or something can go wrong. That's why we want to make this uh, available to you guys. You know, we've got blueberries, uh, of course, blackberries, again, apples. And I believe I need to clarify this and I should have done this beforehand, but I got busy this afternoon taking care of some other stuff. But you see these different bars and how they're colored here down the page i believe that has to do possibly with bloom time and again what did we talked about with apples earlier is that you really need to have two varieties or two different cultivars that flower in the same time or similar times to get good pollination i think that's why that's highlighted or, or colored the way it is but i need to double check on that and i will let you know um, but again that is something that that we really I uh, want to push and make sure people get good quality products um, from reputable sources, not, not hating on any certain places, but I'm just telling you, the more hands that touch it, the more likely something could go wrong. All right, so this is a question we get asked a lot as extension agents. Do I really need to spray? Do I really, really have to spray? And whether you come into, into this meeting tonight knowing how to use pesticides or you've never touched one and you don't want to touch one with a 10-foot pole. I understand. Uh, we, we deal with people from all walks of life and, and all types of backgrounds and certain philosophies and where they feel about stuff. But many pests and diseases like to eat fruit just like we do. Like I told you, you could take it and multiply it by about 20 or 25, and that's how much little insects and little bugs or four-legged animals like to eat fruit. It's just the way it is. That's nature. Um, this is why cultural practices are very important to home fruit growers. Again, variety selection, site selection is also another big one, and pruning and crop maintenance. We do this for airflow, uh, removing diseased materials. When we're pruning, we have the, what I call the three Ds, dead, diseased, and damaged. If a branch is dead, diseased, or damaged, it goes. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's got to get out of there because we're going to take away from our production later on down the road. Um, in the growing season and down the line throughout that tree's life. So making sure we do some of that stuff is very, very important. Now, if you not saying that you will have to spray, but it highly reduces the chances of you possibly spraying, um, I would encourage you to have some of those products on hand, whatever's labeled for what type of fruit you're trying to grow. Um, but does it say you're going to have to spray? because I would love for, for nobody to have to spray, but unfortunately we don't live in that world. Again, I, I try to have to live in reality. I wish we didn't have to, but sometimes we, we gotta do what we gotta do. Now, I wanna go over pesticide safety really fast. And this is something that's, I don't wanna say it's near and dear to my heart, but it is, um, it's something that I, I, I'm very familiar with. I've had to give multiple talks on it, but really quickly, I wanna show you this publication. I'm not gonna read the entire thing. But this is from our turf grass science folks at UT. Safety of herbicides compared to other commonly used chemicals in the household. Um, bleach is pretty toxic. If you read the label, it can be pretty bad stuff. And so we've got, um, you know, Breeden and, and Brosnan and their crew, they, they've gone through and, and talked about a lot of this. And it basically helps you walk through a label, you know, just an introduction. What is an MSDS sheet? I'll tell you, that's a material safety data sheet. A lot of times in today's day and age, it will just be called an SDS sheet. If you look up labels online, they just say SDS for safety data sheet. They've got a, gotten rid of the M for material. LD is just lethal dosage values. That gives you really down the nitty gritty of the toxicology. Um, 
what is a carcinogen, teratogen, and things of that nature. And, and, you know, talking about making sure we follow the label, making sure that we do the things that we can control in order to not have an accident happen when we do uh, use a pesticide. Biggest thing I can stress from this slide, label is the law. If you break a federal label, you're technically breaking federal law because it's not regulated by TDA. It's not regulated by USDA. It's not regulated by Tennessee Extension. It is regulated by the EPA. Um, those are the feds. So we want to make sure we don't make anybody unhappy because if something happens to where, you know, whether there's a fish kill or I'm using that as an example because that's an easy one, but and it comes back to you and you didn't follow the label, then you are going to be in big, big trouble. So make sure we follow the label. Label is the law. That's what I tell people. Uh, for home fruit production, the biggest things you guys need to understand on a label is the re obviously your application rates and timings and limitations there, but also your REI and your PHI, which stands for reentry interval and your pre-harvest interval. So we're going to look at a label really fast and I'm not advertising for this brand. This is nothing. I'm not promoting the Bonide in any, I think it's how you pronounce it, Bonide or Bonide, but not promoting them in any way, but I will tell you they are a very, very popular brand when it comes to the home lawn and garden stuff. And they're very hey, right. Just Todd, real quick, I'm on my phone so I can see your slides, but okay. I, when you're bringing up these links, I can't see them. I don't know if anybody else can. Okay. Well, our solution to that is well, I'm going to send you the link to the recording. And also, um, I will send out a copy of, of these slides. That way, you have the links. Um, that's a good question, Todd, but all, basically what I just did is it's boneide.com, www.boneide.com and it's B O N I D E. And it's just a brand, uh, of, of home lawn and garden, uh, products you can use and their, and their pesticide stuff. So, but we're just talking about uh, this one in particular is a fruit tree spray and you know, the size is kind of irrelevant. You can get up to a quart or a gallon. And so this is a really popular one, but I want you to, you know, we scroll down here to product literature and there's that SDS sheet, that safety data sheet. But what you want to look at really is the product label. Um, and this is what it looks like. I'm going to zoom in here if I can. Okay, beautiful. Zoom in a little bit. So this is really what we're looking at. We talk about active ingredients or I call it AI for short. This is what you're trying to find. It's on the front of every label. Captan. Since this is a uh, combination product, it controls both listed insects and diseases. So it's a combo product. Captan is your fungicide, malathion and carbaryl, which used to be the active ingredient in seven dust. Um, both malathion and carbaryl are your insecticides that are active in this product. So you have uh, multiple chemicals in one product makes it easy for applications. You're kind of killing a bunch of birds with one stone. Um, tells you what it controls, things like that. Uh, you've got directions for use. And again, this is what I was talking about. It is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. I'm not meaning to scare anybody, but it is on the label. So heads up, if, uh, if something happens, make sure um, you're following the label. All right. Obviously, you got your use restrictions, things like that. But we're going to go down here. Let's talk with, let's go over peaches real fast. And this tells you exactly what it's labeled to control in peaches. You know, plum, curculios, Japanese beetles, spider mites, oriental fruit moth. Um, pe uh, well, excuse me. What type of diseases it controls? You know, green, green peach, uh, black cherry, uh, rusty plum, aphids, things like that. Uh, scab, brown rot, brown rot's the biggest one in peach production. So, um, you know, it, it's a variety of things. Fruit tree stages. Now, this is important for this particular product when you can spray it because it is a combination product. So your fungicides, you would really like to spray during bloom, actually, um, in some circumstances, because when that bloom is open, it, it's the, that's the easiest time for disease or bacteria to get in there and actually cause some harm when the fruit is being uh, conceived. And so we, we've got our stages here when you can, or not when you can spray it, but describing at what time of the growing season this is. 
So we're talking peaches here. Um, all, all rates in this chart below are given in tablespoons per gallon. So they're pretty easy to follow. It's kind of why I like uh, the Bone Ice products as well. Shake well before using. So if you want to make two gallons worth, if you know two gallons worth of spray is what you need to cover your trees, then you need to mix up three tablespoons of product in two gallons of water. And again, do not exceed three applications per year on peaches and do not apply within 21 days of harvest um, and a minimum retreatment interval of 11 days. So you can spray it three times, but you can't do it. Um, you got to do it at least 11 days apart. All right. So let's X out of that. That's very, very quick on how to read a label. Um, and again, there's more stuff that is labeled with this product. But I just, I feel like that's important because a lot of people have a stigma about pesticides and I'm not for or against pesticides. No, they're a tool in the toolbox and sometimes we need to use them. But we need to know how to use them. You know, you're not gonna use a hammer to hammer in screws, right? That's for nails. We, we need a screwdriver or a, excuse me, a, a, a drill or an impact, something like that to get screws in into wood. Okay, so these are some other resources we're going to wrap up here real fast. And now I'll let you guys ask me questions since we have a, a smaller crowd tonight. Um, UTHort.com is a great resource for all of your horticultural needs, whether it's landscape, home and garden, vegetable gardens, uh, small fruits and tree nuts, things like that. Uh, this is a great resource and we'll go to there real fast. I want to tell you about this pub, though, really quick. Uh, disease and insect control and in home fruit plantings. It it gives you all kinds of information for. If there's if there's one thing you need to have a publication of of UT and you're growing home fruit, this is it right here, PB sixteen twenty two, uh, and I can send that in a link to you guys later on. Let's go check out UT Hort really fast, and I want to give a shout out to Dr. Natalie Bumgarner and her team that have come up with this. And she's one of our, our specialists. And this is the home page. So if you're looking just for strawberries or something on like gooseberries, onions, cucumbers, some of the stuff that I have looked up over uh, my time, you know, fruit trees, uh, plants for erosion control, you know, it, you can come up with all kinds of questions you can ask and it'll probably pop up. Um, and if we don't have anything on it, it'll tell you we have zero results for that search. But um, Educational resources, if you click on that, this is where you have these tiles with pictures on them. So you've got backyard wildlife. Um, if you're new to Tennessee, you know, here in Tennessee, we kind of have a, I don't want to say a welcome packet, but that's really where you can look for that stuff. What grows well here? We have, I have all kinds of people who have moved here from, you know, various places and whether it's Michigan, Florida, California, New York, Tennessee is kind of in the middle and we can grow a lot of stuff, but we may not be able to grow it very well in some circumstances. That's a great place for you to land. Shrubs and trees, soil and plant nutrition, and then you know we're down to vegetable gardens, and then our stuff, tree and small fruits and nuts. Um, it's a great, it's a great place to go. So again, uthort.com. It's an endless, endless um, spot for resources. And if you can't find something, give your county agent a call, and we'll be happy to help you. Okay. So does fruit really suit your lifestyle? I hope I haven't busted any bubbles too uh, much tonight, but some of the things we really need to consider are your five S's, sun, slope, soil, space, and sweat equity. Sweat equity is a big one. Management philosophy paired with your crop and cultivar selection. Again, that kind of goes back to your sweat equity, your philosophy, how you're going to manage things. Uh, how strict are you going to be? How stringent? And how much time do you have to put in something? And then Success is largely a factor of avoiding failure. Kind of like what we talked about with apple trees, choosing the right variety up front is going to be the difference in you possibly succeeding or failing. And we want you to succeed. We don't want you to fail miserably. Um, a lot of times we get people calling us after they failed and say, you know, well, this just didn't work for me. And, you know, we've come to find out it's something that could have been avoided on the front end. It's not necessarily by his fault because if you don't know something, you don't know. But that, again, is my goal of this series is to kind of shortcut a lot of those learning curves and to make sure um, make sure that we, we make those decisions uh, properly on the front end. Okay, so go forth and grow fruit. Um, and before we get, get out of here and before I start taking questions from you guys, if you have any, um, I would do want to put this poll up real fast. And it's just two questions. So... Um, 
you guys can can answer this for me really fast. If you don't mind, it'd be great. Um, and be honest with me because I, I need to know I need to know how I'm doing, what you guys want to know. Um, if there is anything that we didn't cover that you want to see covered later on in the future or any questions that you might have. Um, so if you guys don't have anything else, please answer that poll and I will be happy to, uh, to answer some questions here. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Perfect. About 50 minutes. Hey, Ryan, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead, Ms. Cammie. This is Cammie. Um, going back to the apple tree and you know our apple tree situation <laughs> but can you um can you do a dwarf type pollinator if you have a semi-dwarf or do they put the pollinators have to be both semi-dwarf or both dwarf or they, can they be either or our biggest thing there is it just needs to be a different variety flowering at a similar time not necessarily a, a dwarf versus a standard or a semi-dwarf versus a dwarf. The big thing is making sure those varieties are, are somewhat compatible in their flowering times. Okay. That way you can get some cross-pollination. That's the biggest thing. Um, okay. Just like with pecans, it doesn't matter what variety because the trees don't know any difference, all right? They're, they're, they're kind of indifferent and um, mm -hmm. they're opportunistic. They're just looking for pollination to be successful. Um, and with, you know, pears and apples and blueberries and some other things like muscadines, you just got to have that varietal difference. And that way, um, that way you kind of, you let the trees have a chance basically. So, but no, it, as far as this, the type of tree, it does not matter. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're good there. Yeah. Not a problem. We still need to prune those things one day. I need to, we need to get back over there and do that. Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Quick question in regards to pruning. Yeah. So if uh, so, I've been reading the little grow a little fruit tree book, mm -hmm. which kind of helps guide into keeping things more manageable for not needing to use the uh, not having things grow as big where you don't need to worry about when you harvest. Mm -hmm. So in discussing that, they talk a lot about you know you do your pruning in the winter or the early spring, like now, or mm -hmm. the last five weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and then they do basically clean up in the summer to keep things size small. Mm -hmm. Is that as big of an issue here in Tennessee? Like, is there a problem with pruning in the middle of summer? It goes back to your management and how you do that on the front end. Okay. Um, so here's my philosophy about that, especially when we're, let's, Oh, talking peach trees. Peach trees grow notoriously. They grow like a weed. They really do. If you let them get out of hand, and pear trees are notorious for it too. If you let them get out of hand, they will take advantage of you. You've got to keep them in check. Um, it, it depends on how hard you prune during the wintertime and when they're dormant, to be honest with you, Andrew. Um, big cuts, I like to tell people, make sure you make it while they're dormant. Okay. Right because I compare it to surgery. I don't want to wake up in the middle of surgery and somebody, you know, be cutting me wide open. Um, I would rather be completely under, put me under anesthesia. That's the same way with a tree. That's a kind of, that's my best analogy I can give you. Now with little cuts, you know, doing some stitches, making some minor work, you know, getting a splinter out here and there, I can take that while I'm awake. Um, and those are the minor cuts and things like that. If you have a tree that's just really, really overgrown, all of a sudden it's just shot out some random, you know, really big water spouts and things of that nature. Can you go ahead? Can you go back in there and prune in the summer or late summer? Sure. I would wait until the fruit is off the tree to do that. Okay. That would be my recommendation. Some people may disagree with that, but when you have fruit on there, you're, you're talking about damaging it and things like that. And then you open it up, you know, for fruit or uh, excuse me, say you get a wound on the fruit itself, you have disease that gets in there and it can just harbor some stuff. And I like to wait till that fruit's off the tree. And then right, right after that, go back in and make some of those cuts if you have to. But if you're, I like to tell people, most of the time, if you're doing your pruning right in the dormant season, you're probably not going to have to worry about it till the next season. Now, 
Some people like to split it up. And it's just a workload thing. Sometimes we like to make our big major cuts in the winter and make a lot of those smaller cuts in the fall. And again, that's just simply out of doing it twice a year. Maybe we don't have the time. Maybe we don't have, um, you know, it, it's just personal preference in that regard. But to me, I would like to go ahead and just prune them once a year and on a tree by tree basis, if we have to go back in there in the late summer and do it after the, after the fruit's off, then, you know, go and make some of those cuts. I wouldn't be afraid to. Hey, Ryan. Yes. How you doing? Hey, I'm good. Uh, How about you? Uh, great, great, great show tonight. I, I really, uh, I'm glad I could put on a show. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it, it was, it was, uh, it was good. It was informative. Um, uh, I have a couple of things that want, first I want to, Maybe you don't know about it. Do you know about the Dolga app, uh, crab apple tree that you can put in your orchard for, for pollination? It'll pollinate all your apple trees. I have heard of it, but I do not have any experience with it. I'll be okay, honest we, with we got one. We planted it. We, we, we did our homework and research with some people. So anybody right. out there that's <clears throat> having a problem with pollination, recommend them to get a Dolga uh, crab apple. Okay. Uh, they, they really come highly wrecked, especially in Tennessee. How do you spell that? D O L G O. Dolga. It's Dolga a white dolga. dolga. It's got to be a white dolga. Where did you get yours? We ordered ours online <laughs> and they sent us a beautiful tree. I mean, it's already budding. I mean, it's already, uh, we planted it a month ago. It came uh, ready to go and it was a really well cared for tree. Uh, where was the name of the place we got that? I, I, it, I'd have to go check it, but it was at an orchard or a farm in Georgia. It was in, come out of Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. They okay. real, FedEx, it shipped it really nice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next question I have. We have a severe problem with beetles. Mm -hmm. Japanese oh. beetles. Huh? Japanese, Japanese beetles. Yes. I mean. Horrible. <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, I, I, I trapped them by the tens of thousands last year. Mm. And I don't know what I could do to spray my, they just eat my, they, they'll take my cherry trees and literally strip them mm -hmm. overnight. Yeah. They, they come in here so bad, Yeah, you know, and I don't know what to do to, to fix that. I don't know how to, I mean, I put the traps out, but it's just, it's just not enough. Well, right. oil. I use Neom oil. We try to do a lot of earth. natural things because we don't really like, you know, chemicals. Right. Diatomaceous earth. Use diatomaceous earth and things of that nature. Okay. If you've got that bad of a problem, I'm probably going to have to go ask Dr. Lockwood about that. He's our fruit specialist and he's been with UT for, I want to say 50 years. <laughs> he's been with us. Wow. So yeah. if there's anybody that I trust to ask, it's going to be Dr. Lockwood or one of my other agents. So, um, so Japanese beetles, bad. more natural home remedy stuff, but they're pretty yeah. severe, right? Is what I understand. Yeah, we got them pretty bad. They come in, and it's it's funny. They come in, you're only here for about three weeks, okay, and they're gone. But in three weeks, they just about kill everybody, right? Um, yeah. I might have to ask Doc on that one because that's I, you are not the first person I heard that from. We had a lot of big insect pressure last year <clears throat> yeah a lot of people blamed it on cicadas but we had a really good year for insects last year but um yeah i'll ask doc on that and, and get back with you that's gonna that's yeah. something that's as far as that sheer amount of beetles we may have to go a different route i don't know what that route is exactly but i'll, I'll do my best to find out for you yeah well last year was pretty bad the year before wasn't it was bad enough Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to hope maybe there's something I can do to get ahead of it this year right. to tr try to combat it a little better. Cause I got, a, I got, I got, we got our beautiful orchard. Trees are beautiful. I've been really, I put a lot of time in it. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I love doing it. I yeah. love, it. you know, it's just, I like seeing things grow and produce mm -hmm. and uh, it just breaks your heart when you put all that work into it, <laughs> you know, and then you got some kind of bug come by and just, Undoes everything you've done. I know, you know? all too well. Uh, I plant a lot, I planted a lot of wildlife food plots for deer and turkeys in my day, and um, yeah, it does break your heart whenever you see all that hard work and effort and energy just seems like it goes to waste, and you're like, well, 
and you just kind of have to pick it back up next year and say, we're going to try it again. Um, just like right now, we just had that cold, cold front come through and mm -hmm. my peach trees are already in, in bloom. Mm -hmm. And I had to cover them and put heat lamps underneath them. Yeah. To protect them from the cold. I, I don't know where it's going to, if it's going to do any good, if, uh, you know, but they look beautiful. Yeah. I mean, but I just can't understand why they're blooming so early. Well, I, I was telling Andrew before everybody got on here, I was dealing with some folks in Dandridge. Um, they had two peach trees, and, they, and it's not their fault. They moved into this house, and they were already there, and they're in good shape. But I would guarantee you they are under 600 chill hours. So they, when, as soon as they get it, they're going to start pushing blooms. They yeah. bloomed two weeks before – no, almost two and a half weeks, three weeks before that big snow came through. Now – I think they survived because whenever that, whenever they close back up, they can handle a little bit more, but during that bloom time, right before or right after, like you said, they don't like to do, they don't do very well just because of the sheer temperatures. Um, yeah. I have heat lamps under mine. I put, uh, we have actual bought uh, fruit uh, canvases. Right. That come over the tree and we put mm -hmm. uh, heat lamps on it, which works really well. The first cold spell. Yeah. And we took canvases off, and they, they look beautiful. The oh, blooms, yeah. Blooms there. Nothing yeah. was hurt. So yeah. we had to redo it again this week. Because this weekend, it's got, well, like this morning, it was 21 degrees. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. It, it seems to work. We only yeah. have two, luckily, two peach trees. Yeah. But, yeah, we yeah. read the peaches don't do well in Tennessee. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. and that's the thing. That's what, you know, we can grow a lot of things in Tennessee. We may not be able to grow everything very well. But can we grow it? Absolutely may not have great success but um yeah. and again that i, I want to speak to that you guys have two peach trees you said you know yeah. you might be willing to do some other stuff that maybe people with 25 peach trees may not want to do right right because again it's all about scale and, and how big or how small your i say your operation is, how big or how big or small however much effort and time you want to put in so yeah this a is a great just, example yeah this is just for our personal use mm -hmm. And if we harvest enough, we can give the neighbors and stuff like that. You know what I mean? We're right. not oh, we're yeah. just well, I'm doing it for a hobby. You know, yeah. I like doing it. Yeah. Well, you're like me. I like doing it too. And it's just it's something I like seeing stuff grow, and that's kind of one of my passions, but that's good. Good it question. Break our, it break our hearts thinking of people with 25, 30, 50 peach trees. Like like there's a pick your blueberries down here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we called the guy la um, last year and uh, here in Rogersville. And uh, he said, you know, that the frost, frost got, them. got them all. Yeah. You know, and that, I mean, he's got pick your own and several, <laughs> several, you know, blueberry bushes. Whenever, uh, and I still keep up and talk to the, one of the producers that I dealt with in, in Georgia. And they were all kind of reeling when that storm came, the snowstorm came through for us, but it brought chilling temperatures um, to the peaches surprisingly some of them made, a lot of them made it through but you know you're talking about your entire livelihood and so again yep. it's all about scale it's all relative but um yeah i understand i understand um does anybody else have any questions if not yeah, i know it's 7 30 i didn't want to take uh, really more than an hour hour 10 on each one of these sessions so if you guys don't have any more questions we will hop off here um and i will uh, i will do I have to figure out how to get the recording up. I'm going to put it on our YouTube channel. That's what I'm planning on doing. And uh, that way everybody can watch it. And so um, if you have any questions, just feel free to give me a call at our office. Uh, if you don't have my number, it is 865-397-2969. Just ask for me. If I'm not there, the, the girls will take a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, but with that, if you ain't got any more questions, I'm going to let everybody go. Thank you guys for tuning in. I appreciate you. And um, hopefully you got something from tonight. Yes, Thank we did. You. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Ryan. You Ryan. Bye. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. See you guys. Have a good night. You, you too. Thanks.